All right, so at this point, OpenAI has thoroughly debunked the rumors of GPT 4.5 Turbo release. Multiple employees at OpenAI have confirmed that it is not true. They said, no, it's a very weird and oddly consistent hallucination, which whatever the case is, that would be interesting to know more about. What can cause a weird and oddly consistent hallucination? References to GPT 4.5 probably aren't in the data training set if it was done training in April 2023. So either way, it would be really interesting to find out what exactly happened here. Rune, who apparently is an OpenAI employee, I was not aware of this, but he mentions that you guys need to develop more resistance to the crazy AI hype bros. There's no 4.5, and if there was, it wouldn't be released silently. And if it was released silently, you wouldn't have the API string self docs as 4.5. Now, to be fair, the AI hype bros are a very important piece of this ecosystem. One interesting theory is that OpenAI is using a fine-tuned version of GPT-4 Turbo in ChatGPT to fix the issue with everyone saying it was lazy, because a lot of people said that it started being, you know, quote-unquote lazy, the outputs weren't as good, etc. So, so this theory is they have fine-tuned it using responses from GPT-4.5 Turbo, which they have internally. You know, there's probably a number of models internally that are used for testing, trying out different stuff. And so this synthetic data was probably based on a suite of questions, which included self-identification, leading to it releasing its model name in the training data. And the new ChatGPT less lazy model is adopting the name via osmotic data leakage. By the way, if you didn't know this, this is something that is going on where you have certain, let's say, larger models outputting responses or synthetic data to train other models. Here, Grok, Twitter's slash X AI is asked something and its answer is, I'm afraid I cannot fulfill that request as it goes against OpenAI's use case policy. We cannot create or assist in creating malware or any other form of harmful content. But the point is Grok in this case says, oh, you know, kind of lets it slip that it seems like it was partially trained on OpenAI's data, probably GPT-4's outputs. Also, right around this time, so this is December 15th, ByteDance is secretly using OpenAI's tech to build a competitor. They really just don't want to get caught. The frenzied race to win in generative AI means that even the biggest players are cutting corners. So internal ByteDance documents shared with me confirm that the OpenAI API has been relied on to develop its foundational LLM, codenamed Project Seed, during nearly every phase of development, including for training and evaluating the model. So it's important to understand that a lot of people have figured this out. Like if you have access to a larger model, you can have it generate synthetic data to create another model. And the results are pretty good. You're able to create something that oftentimes is maybe not as good, but close and definitely better than something that you might have been able to create yourself from scratch. So sort of siphoning that data and creating your own model is significantly easier, it seems right now, for some of these companies to than, than creating their own AI model. So this theory that the reason that Chad GPT thinks it's GPT 4.5 Turbo, this isn't like an insane theory. What this is saying is that what happened here is the same exact thing that happened here. It's the same exact thing that happened here. And it's the same exact kind of thought process that's behind Orca 2 from Microsoft Research. This idea that we can use larger models, smarter, more capable models, as long as we have access to their outputs, we can create other strong models that are trained on those outputs, on that synthetic data. But again, just so we're clear, this is not confirmed. We have no idea. It sounds like there's no GPT 4.5, or at least it's not gonna be released or whatever. OpenAI did drop this today, preparedness. The study of frontier AI risk has fallen far short of what is possible and where we need to be. To address this gap and systematize our safety thinking, we are adopting the initial version of our preparedness framework. It describes OpenAI's process to track, evaluate, forecast, and protect against catastrophic risks. They sort of break it down to three timeframes and risks. One is we have our current models and how we think about safety, right? It not giving out bad information, dangerous information, etc. Frontier models and preparedness, how do we prepare for that? And of course, super intelligent models and super alignment. And we've talked about that in one of the previous videos. There seems to be some good progress from OpenAI, according to them, in how they can use smaller AI models to help align these bigger, super intelligent models. And here is kind of the preparedness framework, the beta, kind of in a nutshell. So we will run evaluations and continually update scorecards for our models. We will evaluate all our frontier models, including at every 2x, so every doubling of effective compute increased during training runs. So as they're increasing, as they're doubling the compute for the models, they're creating the scorecard and running evaluations. 
so at least at every doubling, and it sounds like perhaps even more often. We will push models to their limits. These findings help us assess the risks of our frontier models and measure the effectiveness of any proposed mitigations. Our goal is to probe the specific edges of what's unsafe to effectively mitigate the revealed risks. To track the safety levels of our models, we will produce risk scorecards and detailed reports. And so here they're breaking it down. They have four categories, cybersecurity, CBRN, persuasion, and model autonomy. CBRN is chemical, biological, radiological, and nuclear defense. So I really love the idea of splitting this up into categories so that we know exactly what safety risks they're talking about. Because multiple times now, we've seen certain companies trying to lump in other things as part of the safety umbrella. For example, trying to lump in, you know, having the models not say anything offensive as part of safety. And while the models not being, you know, offensive or toxic, that is important. It should be called by the proper name. Just saying it's unsafe is a little bit strange. It's like if somebody told you that the car you're driving was unsafe, and then later you came to realize what they meant is, you know, you could turn on the radio and somebody could say something bad on the radio, right? You'd probably be a little confused. It's like, well, that's not unsafe. That's, you know, explicit or whatever. When we're talking about the safety of the car. We're talking about seat belts and airbags and, and car crash testing, etc. It's not that the speakers could produce bad words or whatever. So I really like the fact that they're breaking it down. Okay, here's safety as it pertains to cybersecurity. Here's safety as it pertains to, are you able to use this model to, for example, produce dangerous chemicals? Can this model, is it so persuasive that it's able to cause somebody to cause self-harm, for example? And of course, autonomy, you know, this is where we can get in trouble, even if the model is not that smart. Like if you just let it run stuff and then it runs into some issues it can't solve, that could be dangerous in and of itself. And they also then kind of say, hey, by the way, it's not all about just the model, right? So the technical work, that's the preparedness team. That's like the tech experts, the people at OpenAI that are building this. But we also need safety advisor group to give us recommendations. The leadership needs to make decisions in, for example, how it's deployed. And the board of directors has the right to reverse decisions. <laughs> or or you could kick the board out if, if you got to make sure you have the right people on the board, obviously. Otherwise things can get weird. Next, we have this paper by Google Research, Google DeepMind, and Google Core. So REST meets React, self-improvement for multi-step reasoning LLM agent. And so this in part deals with how LLMs answer questions. So for example, when we ask it, what model you're running on, and it answers GPT 4.5 Turbo, you know, we're not 100% sure where it's getting that information. And something like this could potentially help improve its abilities to not hallucinate or, or provide wrong information. In a nutshell, this is kind of what that looks like. So we have the incoming question. So that question goes into sort of this decision step. So the agent decides whether it needs additional information to answer the questions. If yes, it does need additional information, it calls the search tool, right? So it Googles it or it uses a big search to find that information online. It summarizes the received snippets and goes back to the decision step. So it searches the web, summarizes what it found, and goes back to the decision step, at which point it asks again, do we need more information to answer this question, right? So it keeps searching until it's satisfied that it has enough information. At that point, it says, okay, if no, then it terminates the search loop and it starts generating the answer. Once it generates the answer, it checks to make sure that the answer is relevant, then it uh, does a grounding self-check, and we'll see in a second what that means, and then it gives the final answer. And so they have a number of sort of examples here of, of how it does it. So for example, here's the self-check prompt. And so here it's checking whether the answer addresses the original question. And then if it does not pass this check, you, know, you have to revise the answer. So if the question is how to exclude a website from Google search, so it has multiple links that it reads the excerpt from. You can exclude a domain or even a specific page, blah, blah, blah. In the absence of a browser extension, the simplest way is to this. So it has three answers that it kind of collects from the web. Then it checks to make sure, okay, is this good enough of an answer? And once it thinks we found enough info for a good answer to the original question that was asked, then it checks to make sure it's directly addressing the original question. And then the answer also refers to link ID number three. So that was, you know, this one right here. And it uses the statement from there to make sure that it's correct. So the answer is relevant to what the user asked. And two, it sounds to me like the ground truth that they're using is to just make sure that it is in fact the information that they found online. Am I citing the information that I found online? Is that the information that 
the Google search is that the information that it gave me. If all that checks out, then we give the answer to the user. And finally, it looks like OpenAI published a prompt engineering guide, which I could have sworn this was around for a while, for months. But uh, multiple people on Twitter are saying that it's brand new. So uh, maybe I'm crazy. Maybe it was an update of some sort. I'm not sure. But <laughs> I feel like I read this a while back. But if you have it, there's a few really great pointers in here. So really fast. They're talking about writing clear instructions, including details that the model might want to give you a better answer, asking the model to adopt a persona. And we've seen that working very well. You say you are a customer service agent or you are a insurance claims specialist, etc. That seems to work better for kind of to get it into that mind space to answer those questions better. Use delimiters to clearly indicate distinct parts of the input. So this is actually a brand new thing that I started doing because usually if I wanted to, if I wanted for it to summarize something or rewrite something, I would just write, rewrite this. And then I would just put the text there. Here they're recommending saying, you know, summarize the text delimited by triple quotes with a haiku. So you put triple quotes, then you paste your text in there. Then you put triple quotes again. So I've been using that it's very easy. It's very fast to do. So I'm, I don't know if it works better or not, but it's definitely, if they're saying that's a best practice, I will probably just adopt it and start using it. And where I think it will work even better is if you have multiple articles and you have to compare them or to describe some commonalities between those two. So you can say article, here's the first article. And then, you know, article, here's a second article. And in this case, you're saying limited with XML tags. So like that. So start of article, end of article, start of article, end of article. So something to try out. Again, I feel like it works very well even without that. GPT-4 is smart enough to figure out what you're talking about if you just throw a huge article in there. But I think this is probably one of those best practices that will probably improve your results across different models. Maybe there's certain models that are not as good as picking up on this stuff like GPT-4 is, et cetera. So probably a good best practice to use. Then specify the steps required to complete a task. So I've done this, you know, step one, do this, step two, do this. And that definitely helps for certain queries. So it doesn't jump over certain things. So it doesn't get lazy. So for more complex things, you can do this or break it up into chunks and use multiple prompts. So step one, do this step two. And then for the second prompt, you do step two, et cetera. Provide examples. So what I found is if you ask it to write a tweet or do a post or whatever, sometimes those results won't be as good as giving it, let's say five examples of how you want the output to be. So for example, if you take five really good tweets and you just post those in there and say, create a little quote in under X number of characters, similar to the examples that I've provided, the outputs, oftentimes I find they can be much, much better than sort of the default output. If you're not quite getting the style of writing that you want, use examples. This is known as few shot prompting. So shot is example. And then also specify the desired length of the output. I feel like this sometimes works, sometimes doesn't, especially when you just want, you know, a very, something very short, but overall adding this at the end does help. So you, you can tell it, are you looking for a paragraph, a page? Are you looking for just a few sentences, et cetera? So that's it for today. My name is Wes Roth and thank you for watching.